Hello and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th edition, all while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we'll go over the origins within the game, how they utilize in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. Today, in celebration of Halloween, we will be taking a look at Grazd, the demon lord of lust and one of the most powerful demons in the entirety of the Abyss. In terms of appearance, Grotz stands at a towering height of 9 feet with an athletic build, with black skin that shined like obsidian, glowing green eyes, and six small horns hidden amongst his swept-back hair. Beyond traditional fangs and pointed ears expected of a demon, Grotz's most well-known features were his six-fingered hands and reptilian hind legs, the demon lord often dressing in absolute finery no matter what form he took. When on the prowl for battle, Grotz often was seen wielding a greatsword dripping with acid, sometimes one-handed, as well as a massive tower shield, often said to depict the visage of two lovers twisted in mixed lovemaking. He was also said to be an extremely cunning and dangerous warrior. Yet, despite this physical prowess and the comparable magical power that the demon lords were said to wield, Grotz was actually a master of seduction, conversation, and cunning, rarely ever having to resort to brute force due to his legendary diplomacy and natural penchant for convincing others to do what he wants. He is identified verbatim as one of the most deeply sexual and erotic beings in all the Forgotten Realms, said to travel across worlds visiting witches, wizards, and sorcerers to grant them both magical power and sexual favors. Nevertheless, he is still as depraved and power-driven as all the other demon lords, but his approach makes him one of the few fiends to have cordial relationships with not just other demon lords, but devils, fey, and even some angels who have faltered from their grace. In terms of the historical origin of Graz, there are actual several different ones to choose from. Some claim that he was actually once an archdevil who served under Asmodeus before breaking off, either due to being corrupted by the abyss that he waged war in, or simply becoming disillusioned with the great machine of hell and its sole purpose of serving Asmodeus. Another one features Grotz as the son of the mysterious demon lord Pale Knight and another entity, the identity of which is usually speculated to be gods such as Zaheer, an unnamed daemon, Asmodeus himself, or even one of the eldritch outer gods. Between these two competing theories, I prefer the former one, and you'll see why when I give advice on how to run and roleplay Grotz in your games. In terms of his relationships, Grotz was often worshipped on the material plane by monstrous races such as Lamias, Medusas, and even Changelings, with his order of high priestesses known as the Chosen leading the march in ritualistic depravity and vicious manipulation. Grotz's frequent dalliances with the witches he fancied or the wizards who summoned him resulted in a host of half fiend children such as both Tiflings, Succubi, and Cambion, with some discovering their father's identity and traveling to the Abyss in an attempt to usurp his power, with varying results of pure failure. His two most famous children, who I like to call Grotz's Great Bastards, are his half-elf son by the drow priestess Eclavdra, who we covered in a previous video, by the name of Athux, who served as a general in his demonic army. Then there's also his daughter Thraxia by a long-dead human monk, who serves him faithfully as his personal assassin. But Grotz's most prolific relationship has to do with the legendary witch mage, Tasha, who we also had covered in a previous video. Powerful enough to bind and trap him on the material plane, Tasha used the insight that she wrenched from him to elevate her own power, with their story having them end up either as bitter enemies or deeply entrenched lovers. Grotz succeeded in escaping back to the Abyss, but their passion still runs deep, with Tasha giving birth to a son by him by the name of Ayuz. When it comes to his actual court, Grotz's most powerful servant is a hyper-intelligent demon by the name of Varen, who shared in Grotz's pension to keep a humanoid form but with deathly pale skin and a constant oozing of spiritual slime. He served as Grotz's chamberlain and chief ambassador to other demon lords. And other allies include a pair of Marilith escorts, Unhath and Redohantis, his six Lamia attendants, a Garishjo demon named Orwans, who acted as Grotz's personal border control for his region in the Abyss, and Rule of Three, a Cambian strategist focused on the killing and or capturing of Celestials for his lord. In terms of his enemies, Grotz's greatest foe and the target of many of his machinations was Waukeen or Wukeen, the goddess of wealth and merchants in the Forgotten Realms. From imprisoning her in his realm and forcing her to witness strange abyssal celebrations and rituals done in her honor, to having his faction of the six-fingered gentlemen infiltrate and insert themselves within positions of authority in her church, Grotz's overall actions sundered Wukeen's clergy to the point of a massive schism, with many of her own priests believing that Wukeen escaped because she sold Grotz pieces of her divine power, serving as the bedrock for his considerable influence in the abyss and over the mortals of the material plane. Whether or not this is true is up to you as a dungeon master, but I personally think that it's interesting for a demon lord to blackmail his way into godhood. And as per usual, Grotz was also known to war with other demon lords in the abyss, his primary enemies being the bestial lords Baphomet of the Minotaurs and Inagu of the Gnolls. Other foes included Malkenthet, the queen of the succubi, and whose fiends Grotz often commanded or seduced into his court, as well as the demon lord Kosashi and Gwynharif, a legendary champion of the Eladrin. 
I could also imagine him being a great enemy of Soon, the goddess of love and beauty, which are two attributes that are often perverted and twisted by Gross for his own ends. When it comes to running Gross at the table, you can take one of two approaches with him. You can play him as the traditionally seductive devil, the serpent in the Garden of Eden if you would, where he simply offers power, pleasure, and station in his demonic army to your players in hope of corrupting them. But more often than not, your players are more inclined to tell him to stuff it before wailing on him or whatever agent he has sent to serve as the campaign's villain. As such, I like to take a bit more of a deeper approach with the Demon Lord of Lust. Grotzt, in my opinion, is never as obvious as showing up in a PC's dream simply to offer a deal. He isn't a devil after all, he is a demon, and is thus free from the constraint of having to convince mortals to willingly part with their souls. As such, Grotzk will often take the form of friends, allies, or invaluable people that the others will want or need to interact with, and he will play the part of the helpful friend until he has these poor souls trusting him completely. Only then, when their past friendship and experiences cause them to wash away any potential doubt, does he begin to ask for small things of these people. Things that are strange to ask, but small in comparison to the things that he's already helped them with. Eventually, they'll grow bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually Grotzt has managed to have these people whoring themselves out for him in various ways, all while saying thank you for the opportunity to serve. My reason for this approach is because in my mind, Grotzt did serve as Modius for a time, but not out of a particular devotion to the cause or because he feared or was less powerful than him. Grotzt did it instead, to learn, to understand the ways of the devils and the methods that they used to outwit and overcome the limits put on them by Asmodeus and the Pact Primeval. Marrying this knowledge with his considerable charisma and lack of such a constraint, Grotzt took the abyss by storm through diplomacy, cunning, and seduction. As such, many demon lords are either on good terms with Grotz diplomatically or swear fealty to him due to his immense power, save for those who engage in constant battle and war such as Baphomet, Inagu, Katsuchi, etc. This is because Grotz doesn't play the game on their terms. He doesn't raise armies and march into war to show off his strength. Rather, he works to make peace and negotiates to start with outright war as a last resort and often very one-sided by the time negotiations break down. All this is to say that Grotz is conniving, smart, and willing to bargain with or help others if it means he gets something out of it in the end. His charisma and charm can break down the weak of will, while his pragmatism, intelligence, and cunning can disarm those who remain unfazed by his looks. This makes him one of the most dangerous villains to ever encounter in the Abyss or anywhere else, armed with the strength and brutality of a demon, but the mind and guile of a devil. It's no wonder that creatures like the Demogorgon are struggling to maintain leadership in the Abyss. They just simply can't compete. Lastly, in terms of how Gratz affects the material plane, there is no doubt in my mind that he would be one of the largest progenitors of Tiflings, followed closely by fiends such as Levistus and Asmodeus. If you decide to play a Tifling born of Grotzt, I would recommend using the Devil's Tongue variant from the Sword Coast Adventures Guide, or even the Unearthed Arcana Abyssal Tifling if you want to have an actual tie to the Abyss and play with a bit of random chance for your heritage spells. As to how you would play a Grotzt born Tifling, that's mostly up to you. I don't subscribe to the notion that every Tifling acts like the fiend that made them, but I have no doubt that Grotz Tiflings have an easier time carrying a strong allure and a natural charisma. They can make for great diplomats or peacemakers for those keeping with good alignments, or manipulative political powerhouses for those who are more inclined to evil. Now, I would personally never suggest having the party fight Grotz head on as he is both too smart and too careful to catch himself in a situation where he would need to fight for his life alone. He has armies for a reason, and he'll maneuver them in any way that he has to ensure the party doesn't get to him, or at least are significantly weakened before they can come to face him. You can always take the aspect approach in which an avatar of Grotz appears to battle the PCs, but I would imagine Grotz does this more to test his strength, learn about the characters, and see what changes he needs to make to his grand plans in the future. That said, when it does come to combat, Grotz wields both his tower shield and acid bleeding greatsword Angdrelv, the Wave of Sorrow, and is often depicted as wearing a set of black abyssal full plate. At a really high challenge rating of 24, Grotz's stat block on page 184 of the Monsters of the Multiverse is more than enough for a high level villain, complete with the standard magic resistance, 350 HP, immunities to non-magical damage, as well as legendary actions, legendary resistances, and the immunity to being charmed, exhausted, frightened, or poisoned. Considering you will be fighting Grotz at a minimum of third tier play, which is around levels 11 to 15, make sure to pay attention to the abilities that he has, as they are specifically made to combat multiple enemies at once. First thing we'll focus on is his Greatsword attack, which he can use to make two attacks or substitute one of them to cast a spell. This means that you don't need to spend a single action to cast a spell like most creatures need to, allowing you to sort of have your cake and eat it too. You can walk up to the party wizard, cast Dominate Person on the Barbarian right next to him, force that Barbarian to walk up behind the wizard, and now you can make your attack with advantage with flanking. 
His change shape bonus action is very useful for roleplay and big reveals, but not much for anything else outside of combat. Unless you want Grotz to mess with the party by pretending to be somebody else that they care about or have interacted with before breaking out his entire stat block while still wearing their face. Be sure to make use of his special negate spell reaction to avoid big spells cast by the party such as Finger of Death or Disintegrate. It's essentially a free charisma powered counterspell, and if it succeeds, you won't need to spend a legendary resistance in order to avoid the spell's effects, and can save that for later. So just be sure not to forget about that. His Abyssal Magic legendary action allows him freedom of movement about the battlefield with teleport, or active use of his spells beyond his normal turn, which is great for charming the party's frontliners and sicking them back on their allies, or force pushing the barbarians straight off a cliff into the bowels of the abyss with telekinesis. Meanwhile, his Dance My Puppet legendary action can force those under the effects of his charm spells to be moved into more perilous positions, such as in the way of an oncoming spell, off the ledge into a hazard for additional damage, or right in front of him so that he can chop their head off with his acidic sword. And finally, his lair actions include Agitate Beasts, Beguiling Realm, and Mirrors Everywhere, each of which is used mostly for thematic and roleplay purposes and only take effect once the party is within 6 miles of the lair itself. Agitate Beasts causes creatures of the beast type to begin fighting and coupling in the way that they engage during mating season, reflective of Graz's lust portfolio. Beguiling Realm causes all persuasion and deception checks to be made at advantage, while all insight checks are to be made at disadvantage. This is perfect for installing some tricky fiends who will try to deceive or steal from the players, or convincing them to do something that may be against their best interest. And lastly, Mirrors Everywhere simply causes flat surfaces within one mile of the layer to become highly reflective and polished, so long as they are made of stone or metal. This could be a reference to Graz's vanity, and could yield some very interesting combat encounters, such as a crystal golem reflavored as a mirror golem, the mirror-dwelling undead Oracula from the Book of Beautiful Horrors, linked in the description below and I highly recommend, or even clones of the PCs who emerge out of the mirrors in a twisted uncanny fashion, little mirrors replacing their eyes. Now, in terms of quests involving Graz, holy orders of Wukin, Soon, and really any other god can be keen to put an end to the schemes of his cults, and the cults of other demon lords will no doubt scuffle with him over power and influence within the material realm. Depending on the timeline you choose to play in, you can engage in a quest to free Wukin from her prison within Graz's realm, or engage in an investigation of her church in order to uproot the six finger gentleman agents who have been placed in positions of power. This could make for a very good political or espionage focused campaign. And then of course, perhaps Tasha herself taps the group for a quest in retrieving some magical components for her, and when they return, they can witness the binding of Graz itself, fueled by the components that they have delivered her. With the demon lord bound, the gods and other demon lords who despise him can gain a little bit of breathing room and conduct their business without his interference, even if this means that Tasha herself grows more powerful by dissecting information from him. The enemy of my enemy is my friend after all. If Kratz himself presents some quest to the party, it could be in the form of acquiring information, influence, and power within the realm, and he will always do so in a way that does not reveal his presence until it is too late. In the shape of a rival noble, he can pass the party to convince a politician to join his cult in order to provide fodder for blackmail in the future, or just flat out assassinate him if he refuses to remove him from play. Under the guise of a priest, he can even urge them to uproot and destroy a rival cult of the Demogorgon, Baphomet, or Yinagu, wishing it to be done out of the church's divine duty to quote unquote, rid the world of demonic influence. Graz likes to play, and he will reward the party with little trinkets and such if they successfully do a good job. Positive reinforcement is always the better approach anyway. In terms of the magic items that Graz cults can wield, or that the demon lord himself might get for rewards, here's a list of things that I think make sense for you to give out to your players, mostly acid damaging weapons, or items that allow players to be a little bit more influential in their interactions with others. Each item has the book page attached, so be sure to check them out. And lastly, for our magic item this video, we have the Love Bite, a plus 2 dagger that requires attunement and deals an additional 1d6 acid damage on a successful hit. Attack rolls and damage rolls made with this item and get a plus 2 bonus, and additionally, once per short rest, the wielder can choose a creature that they damage with this weapon over the course of that day. At the end of the day, the target must make a DC 15 wisdom saving throw, or be marked with the Love Bite curse reflected on their neck. The target then becomes charmed as per the spell charm person, and is supernaturally prompted to seek out the wielder whom they become obsessed with. They would treat them as an object of affection and will follow orders to the letter so long as it doesn't cause direct harm to them themselves. Every 24 hours, the target may make a new saving throw to end the effect, and the remove curse spell can also remove the effect. And this ability can only affect one target at a time, and upon another target being affected, it ends on the previous target. I've included the item stat block in the description below, and that's Scrots the Demon Lord of Lust, everybody. I want to thank all you guys for watching, and if you guys enjoyed this video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe, and press the little bell icon in the corner to be notified of future videos. If you guys want to be able to vote on the subject of future videos, you can follow my link in the description to cast your vote. 
And also DMs, let me know what kind of campaigns you run with Grotz. Players, let me know how you've encountered him or run characters that were aligned or worshipped him. And also let me know what kind of things you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, happy Halloween, and I'll see you guys next time.